always follow my own direction No one can pull me out I've always felt different from the others I'm running away now Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of Ring Respect Radio. I am Bobby Munson, and the man beside me, you know him, the man with the angelic voice, Papa Smokes. And our special guest at this time, the man below right there, that is Mr. Rich Fokiti. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to join us right here on Ring Respect Radio. Ah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, we've been very much looking forward to the opportunity to talk to you. We're uh, obviously big fans of MLW, so we've seen a lot of your work over there, but... Definitely wanted to have an interview and be able to talk to you about uh, your career in broadcasting, uh, something that we do on the uh, independent side. We uh, right here in Canada, we have a promotion for pro wrestling. Pop Smokes and I have been on the commentary side, and we want to be able to sit down with somebody who's in that line of work and be able to just find out a little bit more about you and about the business as well, too. And so just kind of want to start it off. Uh, what, what got you into broadcasting or doing uh, play-by-play commentary? Oh man, you know, um, I think the first thing that, that kind of drew me to broadcasting was music, actually. Um, college radio, of all things. And, uh, and I grew up in the, uh, in the Boston, Pro- Providence, Rhode Island, but greater Boston area. And, uh, you know, in the, in the 90s, it, college radio was, was a big deal, right? 80s and 90s. Um, and we had tons of great college radio stations. And if you were into music like I am, I'm a huge audiophile. Um, that was the place at the time where you were able to find independent music as opposed to stuff that was on MTV. Um, so I was like, oh, gee, you know, when I go to college, I want to do, I'm going to do college radio. So I did, um, and quickly realized that, you know, being a, being a DJ or whatever was not what I wanted to do. Um, I also played hockey growing up. Uh, I played goalie for my high school hockey team and, uh, loved the game and wanted to find a way to, to kind of be around the game. And uh, I was sitting at, uh, I was on a lunch break at work one night, and I went out to my car, and I put on the Providence Bruins game, and it kind of dawned on me. I was like, wait a minute. There's an American Hockey League team, like, right down the street. Hmm. And I loved the Bruins growing up. I loved listening to Fred Cusick, uh, Fred Cusick and Derek Sanderson, who did the Bruins games on uh, on Channel 38. And I was like, geez, you know, maybe I can become a play-by-play guy. It was just kind of like on a whim, like, maybe I can do this. And uh, I started doing. I started driving to games with a tape deck and calling games and figuring out how to do it. And driving back from the games and cringing, listening to myself. And uh, over time, kind of figured out what I was doing. And one thing led to another. I did hockey for a long time, and uh, just through kind of happenstance and dumb luck, I, I kind of stumbled forward into into doing wrestling. So it's been uh, it's it's been an adventure. It's been a trip. It's not one that I necessarily. Uh, that I advise a lot of people, you know, I get a lot of, hey, you know, do you have any advice for getting into broadcasting? Yeah, don't. Get an accounting <laughs> degree. Like, broadcast on the side or something, you know what I mean? Like, do something where, where you're not going to be, you know, either, you know, it's it's feast or famine in broadcasting. Like, you're either at the top making good money or you're, you know, you're struggling and, and trying to trying to find a way to make it all work. So, um, been a lot of places, done a lot of cool things. I've had a lot of fun. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, it's not for everybody. And that's probably the biggest thing that I, I try to get across when people ask me that. Like, just know what you're getting into because it's not it's not easy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, speaking of pro wrestling, uh, did you grow up a pro wrestling fan or was this an opportunity that came along from your time working within uh, play-by-play for hockey games? Big wrestling fan growing up. Um, we had WWF shows every month in Providence and Boston. I got to those as much as I could. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I really gravitated towards Crockett. 85, 88 Crockett promotions. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's funny you ask about uh, broadcast. Another moment that I had in broadcasting, I was maybe nine or 10, and I remember hearing uh, Tony Schiavone calling, uh, you know, calling wrestling on TBS. And that kind of clicked as well. I was like, hmm, that's actually something people get to do. How do you do that? But, you know, always thinking, well, that's just too far. I'll never be able to get to do that. Right. Uh, but now I devoured as much wrestling as I could as a kid. Um, AWA, NWA, WWF, World Class, you know, whatever wrestling was on, crappy local wrestling that, that was on TV, you know, like some of the really bad indie stuff that would come on sometimes. I mean, I watched all of it. Um, probably the biggest, uh, 
the biggest thrill for me as a kid, as a wrestling fan, in 1987, Crockett ran Boston Garden. And I'll never forget hearing Tony Schiavone on a Saturday night saying, you know, it was, uh, what, I think it was I think it was August 4th, uh, April 4th, I think it was. it was. Saturday night, April 4th, Boston, Massachusetts, Boston Garden. I, <gasps> running around the house, oh, my God, Dad, 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 Dad. <laughs> and, you know, so he took me, and uh, we went again in 88 when they came back, and uh, that was awesome. Yeah, must be a great time. Uh, I do have one question that was posed from uh, one of our close friends here, too. And I, knowing that uh, you have a background working with both NXT and MLW, wanted to quickly find out from you, what is a day working within the NXT ranks, doing commentary for them like versus MLW? What's a, what's a typical commentary day for either show like for you? Um, and, you know, on, on, on a TV day, they're not really all that different. Um, you know, the, the day-to-day, the non-TV days are... You know that's that's a completely different thing. But you know, if you if you're asking specifically about a TV day, um, there there are there are differences. MLW a lot of times we would do production meetings ahead of time, a couple days ahead of time. So when we get there, we're not spending two hours in a in a conference room going over stuff that could have been taken care of. Um, you know, we obviously do an MLW. The budget is not as big as NXT. The staff is not as big, so it's a, it's a lot of hands doing a lot of different things. So it's easier in that regard, to kind of do some of that stuff ahead of time. Um, usually NXT, a TV day would be, uh, there, there'd be a production meeting. Um, and then, you know, you're just, you're going all day. You're ringside during the day. It's the same thing with, with doing SmackDown or doing main event or whatever. A production meeting at, you know, noon or 1 o'clock or whatever. And then you're there. You're, you're at the building until, you know, uh, midnight probably, 11 o'clock, midnight by the time you get out of there. Um, there's a production meeting. You, you kind of get your notes. You get... Uh, you know, your initial rundown of what's going to happen, which, um, you know, in, in WWE's case, changes about probably eight times before you actually go out to the desk. Uh, MLW stuff's a little more dialed in because, uh, you know, we would tape a couple weeks at a time. So you need to, things need to be a little more, a little more pinned down. Um, NXT, with the way that that's produced, or, the way the, or anyway, the way it was produced when I was there, you, you know, you had you had time to go back and fix stuff. Um, and you, you do with ML, there's post-production as well, but, um, you know, probably the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest thing is that just just with MLW, you're kind of a little more dialed into stories. Stuff doesn't change as much on the fly as it would with uh, with WWE. Fair, fair enough. Bob Smokes, I know you're itching to get some questions. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where do you hey, want, really, real quick, where, where are you guys yeah. in Canada? Uh, Saskatchewan. Actually, yeah, it's out of Saskatoon. Saskatoon or what? Saskatoon, you bet. You bet. Yeah. My, uh, what, my the, heard the, of it. The first <laughs> hockey coach that I, the first pro coach that I had was Terry Ruskowski. Okay. And, uh, he was my, he was the coach in Knoxville. He hired me in Knoxville to work there. And I know he, he worked for the Blades for a while. He was oh, the head well. coach of, uh, the Blades in like 89 <laughs> or something like that. So well, back, back <laughs> when the Rob, Blades were still doing really well for themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are they not doing well anymore? Uh, they're okay at times. I mean, we, they're hot and cold. They'll go on a bit of a streak and get us all excited. And then all of a right. sudden it just flattens right out. It's unfortunate, of course, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I was, I was originally born in Calgary and then moved to Saskatchewan here in Saskatoon area. And the Papa Smokes, they're a Winnipeg guy. Oh, wow. God. oh I, uh, Win- Winnipeg. I, I, I got to call a game at the old arena before they, before they tore it down. Oh, nice. The, uh, the Manitoba moose. I remember yeah, that, for sure. And, uh, called a couple playoff games there and uh, enjoyed my time in Winnipeg. I will say this. Everybody says Winnipeg is the coldest place on earth. I, I would counter that with uh, that same trip. We had to go to Milwaukee as well. And for some reason, I, I remember Milwaukee being colder than Winnipeg. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't know why. That's, that, that, that's a tough one to beat because Winnipeg is pretty, pretty cold <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So. Well, I watched a lot of classic AWA in the old Winnipeg arena too, sure. uh, as a teenager. And that, that was some really good times because, uh, all the greats came through there at some point, not all of them, but I saw everybody from Ric Flair and the road warriors to Bockwinkle and Heenan and all those guys. Uh, that was a great time. Right. But I was going to ask you, uh, you were talking about some of your, uh, early wrestling watching influences and such. And I wanted to, ask you what uh, kind of commentary or commentators uh, struck your interest at that time, because you would have been hearing some good ones from uh, WWF, uh, NWA, and uh, and AWA also. Uh, anyone stick in your mind uh, from that period? Yeah, you know, Sh- Shivani uh, was, it's funny because I get to work with him at MLW, but, you know, Shivani mm-hmm. really was a big influence on me. 
in, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, I just, I loved, I loved his delivery, uh, how smooth he was. And getting to work with him, you know, 20 years after the fact was kind of coming full circle. You know, kind of like when getting to work with Dusty at NXT was just crazy. Um, but, you know, just, to, Tony's a baseball guy, right? So he's kind of got that baseball delivery about him. He's got that smooth kind of calm you know, so I slower I, I, kind of hit. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a, I, I think I picked that up from him. Um, but you know, I, I loved listening to you know all all the different announcers for for different reasons. Um, you know, Vince and Jesse had their thing. Gorilla and Bobby was you know like everybody yeah. talks about <laughs> Gorilla and Bobby, right? Um, yeah. You know, I I enjoyed uh, Rod Trongard. His style yeah was, yeah he had that old school radio kind of deep golden pipe sort of voice. You know, he, he had that old school style about him. I, I, I liked listening to him. He was um, a little confused sometimes, too. Was. Like, yeah, yeah, that's what I found funny, yeah, too. Yeah, you know. He, he made he, mistakes, he, and yeah. He, he was, you know, he's more of a, you know, kind of like Bill Mercer, who, who I, I I liked certain things about his style as well down down at World Class. Um, they were sports guys, and they treated it like sports. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and that that's, that's what I think. You know, technically, you go back and you listen to them now, and you can probably pick apart a million different mistakes and stuff they didn't know or whatever um but i think it was just the, the way they approached it is probably what rubbed off on me more you could tell that they were sports guys um you know they weren't constantly shilling constantly salesmen um there's just a little bit of a different approach from say like a vince who was constantly over the top and you know really big on the, the larger than life characters and you know treating it more as entertainment as opposed to calling it like a sport but even you know even vince back in the day was kind of a traditional play-by-play guy in a sense before they really you know dove into the you know kind of the the jerry springer sort of you know wild show business stuff if you will yeah vince just never learned the names of any of the maneuvers hey right. yeah, that's where that what a maneuver came sure. from he said that for everything because he didn't yep. know the names of most of them <laughs> no you know that, that that's <clears throat> i've had that conversation with people too over the years where you know in the indies now there's such a focus on naming moves all the time and you know if you listen to some play by guys all they do is name moves and there's no context there's no storytelling um i always say moves don't matter and you know, what are you talking about moves don't matter well, to me moves only matter when they matter a finish a big move if you call it a suplex does it matter if it's a saito suplex or what i mean maybe kind of in a way but in the kind of what's happening in the match what is the move doing why is the move important to me is more important than you know, being 100% accurate and saying it's a particular type of arm bar. Or, or what. You can get that stuff in. Your color guy can get that in. There's a way to work that in. But if you're just naming off, to me, if you're just naming off rapid fire moves, you might as well be calling a skateboarding competition. Like, you need to tell the story is what's happening, why it matters, and what it means in context of the match, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's and that's honestly been one of the big uh, draws for both of us with MLW is not only do we like the sports presentation, but again, yourself and especially Dombrowski in the last little while, I've done an excellent job. Like when they're bringing in talent from all over the world and we're not necessarily familiar because we haven't seeked them out, telling that story, letting us know who this is, why we should care about particular wrestler coming down to the ring, what their accolades are and what they bring to the table. And that's drawn us in. And that's a, you know, a kudos to both yourself and Dombrowski for doing that. Uh, you've worked with some amazing people and another one, uh, what's it been like? I, I got to ask the question. What was it like sitting beside and working with who's probably the most controversial guy when it comes to I know where you're going. modern wrestling? But you worked with Mr. Jim Cornette. Yep. We're, we're honestly guys that listen to him. We've enjoyed his play-by-play -play as well, too. What was it like getting the opportunity to work with Jim? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I consider Jim a friend. Uh, you know, we haven't talked in a while, but, uh, you know, Jim and I, we – we agree on probably 99% of, uh, of the way we approach things. You know, he, he's an old school guy. He's controversial. Um, you know, he said something to me once. He said, you know, <clears throat> nobody will ever know where, uh, you know, what's his, is it James Michael Cornette? Is that his name? I, whatever his real name is. Yeah, yeah. Right? Basically, nobody will ever know where James Cornette, the person, and James E. Cornette, the wrestling person. Nobody will ever know where that separation is, right? So does he believe everything that he says 100%? <clears throat> I think he does. Does he embellish? Yeah. And it makes for great listening, you know? He riles people up, and that, that's, <clears throat> that's what he did as a manager. 
to what he does now on, on on a podcast. But I thought that was thought that was really interesting and in, in, in a really interesting way to to kind of look at it. Nobody will ever know where the guy ends and the character begins, and vice versa. Jim was great to me. Learned a lot from Jim. Treated me really really well. We had some great conversations. Um, you know, after some of the tapings, we'd go to Denny's. You know, me and me him, a couple of the guys, we get in Black Beauty and you know go to go to Denny's and sit there and you know post wrestling. I Hopper Denny's with Cornette was, I, you know, it, it was really cool. He's another guy that, when I was a kid, saw him on TV. And uh, the funny thing is, I, so I hate medical procedures. I get really antsy going in for medical stuff. And the thing that, and I told Jim this, I said, you know, you're the reason I take Xanax, Jim. And he said, what are you talking about? When he busted his knee off the scaffold, he did a, he did a, an interview when he came back, and he said, and he explained going, you know, when I fell off that scaffold, you know, whatever. When they're wheeling you into the in, in, into the ER and they put that mask over in your face and you count down from ten and you don't know if you're ever going to wake up again. Now at nine or ten years old, I ne- I had, had my tonsils out not long after that, and I never even I was like ah oh, you know like I'm not excited about going to do this, but I never thought about the fact that like they're going to knock me out and like you really don't know if you're going to wake up or not, right? Like you probably will. <clears throat> so because of that, I told him that uh, he created my my fear of. Doctors in, in medical procedures, and I'll never forgive him for that. So, <laughs> that's I was like, because, of because of you, every time I go to get a blood test, Jim, I have to take a Xanax. Thank you. Yeah. And see, we have had similar stories with uh, <laughs> when it comes to the tonsil thing because it was around the same age for me, too. And of course, uh, the uh, POS old man that I had at the time does start telling me stories about what they do when they, you have no control and you're sleepy. Oh, they're going <clears> to <throat> stick a big ass fork down your throat. They're just going to twist away, start shredding things. <laughs> yeah, to hell with you, old man. But, right, so, right. Yeah. Uh, Pop, folks, uh, what do you got next for us? Well, I was just uh, th- thinking about uh, commentary again. Uh, you've done the uh, sports commentary, in particular hockey and a few other things. And uh, I found when when uh, Bobby and I started doing commentary roughly six years ago, I, I tried to go at it from a sports sports based perspective. There's a there's a Canadian football announcer named Bob Irving that I'm a great admirer of, and I try I, I always try to bring a little bit of Bob's knowledge and energy into uh, wrestling commentary. I was wondering what the, what kinds of uh, similarities you saw between the two, and did uh, hockey broadcasting help your wrestling uh, commentary? <clears throat> um, a little bit. In the fact that uh, you know when you when you call a goal and you're calling a sequence of a goal and you're especially for radio, <clears throat> it's a little different on TV. But especially for radio, you kind of you know uh, so when I first when I first started out, there there was a guy named Bob Crocker who back in the day he was the GM of the Whalers, and I'd see him at uh, at games in Worcester, Mass. All the time we'd talk, and you know kind of pick his brakes. He'd been around the game for a long time, and he's like, you know, you almost kind of need to be a thespian when you're doing this, especially on the radio. So. To me, most good radio guys that are calling hockey, there's there's a flow and there's a cadence and a rhythm, and you're gonna you're gonna build to to a goal, right? So you're, you know, Bruins take the puck, send it in, Bort gets it, fires ahead. Here's Neely, Neely cutting in, fires across, Adamos to the net, fires on shots, go! Right, so you're doing that. Yeah. That I hear some radio guys that are just flat, and then they call a goal, and it's they're screaming and. In, in, in yelling, I don't want to. I don't want to rag on anybody publicly, but there's a couple of guys that, that that are like that. Which if that's that's their style, that that's their style. To me, I prefer more of a up and down wavy thing. So, um, you know, to kind of answer your question, when you're calling high spots or you're calling a, a good sequence in a match, when you're building to a finish, to me, you want to reflect that in the tone of your voice, and it doesn't always have to be yelling and screaming. A lot of guys think that to get excited, you have to scream. You don't. But you can in, the inflection in, in, in your voice, um, to me, is, is the key part of that. So I think I took that from hockey into wrestling. The biggest thing that I had to really, really, really wrap my head around that I think most people that start doing wrestling play-by-play um, is the storytelling. Because when, cause when you're doing hockey, you don't have time to tell stories, really, you know? You're calling the play. You're focusing on where the puck is, and that kind of thing. You know, you may have time to get in a tidbit about where a guy was drafted, or you know, before the puck is dropped, a stat about the goalie or something like that. But you're n- you don't really have time to tell a story. You do that stuff in the pregame. You do it in the intermission. In wrestling, if you're just calling moves the entire time, you're not telling the viewer anything. They can see the moves. You don't need to say everything that's happening. So, 
um, you know, kind of the formula for, for calling a match. You get your entrances. You talk about each guy a little bit. But you're setting up. Why is this important? Why, if I'm watching this at home and I just turn this on, why, why should I, why do I give it, why do, why do I care? Why should the viewer care? So set up the stakes of the match. You get into the match. You've talked about each guy a little bit. You're explaining why it's important. This guy said this. If you remember, this happened before and this caused this rivalry to explode and blah, 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 blah. As you get into the match and now you're into the meat of the match, now you're kind of getting into the high spots and you're focusing more on what's happening in the match. Well, he's really been working the leg the entire match. You know, Joe Blow's, you know, knee has to be killing him. Looking at him, he's hobbling around, right? So now you're focusing on that. How is he going to battle through that? The other guy keeps focusing on it. And then you build to the finish, and then you, once the match is over, you're putting over, again, why was the match important? What, what just happened, and what does it mean going forward? So it, it, you're kind of baking in, um, and I, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever even verbalized this before, but if you, if you liken it to hockey, like you're almost kind of taking your pregame in your post game and then the game itself and you're you're melding that into like an eight minute match. You know what I mean? So um you're doing your pregame and your post game as part of the match and then you're calling calling the action as well. Um so there you know there there are definitely similar similarities. I, I think like guys that maybe do baseball might have an easier time coming into wrestling and, you know, learning how to just slow down and not call everything a million miles an hour and just tell the story of what's going on because if you, you know, if you listen to baseball, that's what, you know, Vin Scully, I, I cried when Vin Scully passed away. You know what I mean? I loved listening to Vin. Uh, he's one of the greatest storytellers in the, in the history of baseball. And that, you know, I, I've tried to take some of that in, uh, in, in build that into my, into my wrestling call. So it's been, it's been a process for sure. Awesome. Um, yeah. Pop smokes. Any, any other questions you got there? For- oh yeah. Yeah. I do have some, uh, what about uh, announcing styles between different sizes of companies? Uh, like like we were saying, Munson and I work for a small company in a small city, but um, it looks like it that the style and the whole intensity of the thing has to ramp up for a different size company. And you've worked on the indies and for some of the major companies. What are some differences between the two styles? <clears throat> um, you know, WWE is a very specific way that, that they want you to do things. It's more storytelling than it is anything else. Um, you know, when you're doing the indies, a lot of times they're just cold matches, so there's no stories. So you almost have to kind of make stuff up, you know, talk to guys ahead of time and kind of find something to, you know, to embellish and, and, and talk about. Um, you know, probably the biggest thing <clears throat> from company to company, uh, on the indies, you definitely have a lot more freedom to kind of do, I don't want to say do what you want, but to kind of approach it in a way that's more natural for you. Uh, but, you know, that, that said, a lot of people rag on, on the way WWE does their, their commentary or, or their play-by-play. And there's certainly things that, <clears throat> you know, to rag about. Um, I think that uh, just what, I, what I've read lately, I, you know, I guess it's loosened up a little bit and they're actually able to say wrestling and belt and talk about moves Good and theory. talk about, talk, <laughs> right, imagine that, right? Like talk about history and stuff. Um, you know, but I, I, it's MLW, for, for example, you know, we, we'll, we'll have story notes that, uh, you know, that we go over ahead of time and, yeah, it's, I guess it's the same thing with, with other companies as well. Like, if you have a working relationship with another company, maybe, you know, you're going to talk about them a little bit. Um, and if you don't, why are you going to put them over? You know what I mean? Um, and and it, it all depends. Uh, you know, a world like MLW is more of a closed world where things kind of happen within that world as opposed to doing an indie like I do Defy. Um, we talk about everything. You know, there are certain companies that we don't if there's, you know, if there are issues or certain reasons why, why we would. But generally speaking, everything's fair game when you're doing the indies. You're going to talk about where a guy's been. He flew in from, you know, whatever. He's, you know, you know in the Battle of Los Angeles last night for PWG, you know, had a big match. Some other companies are not going to acknowledge that. So it's just kind of knowing what the promoter wants and, and, and kind of what, uh, you know, what, what the route is there. So. So uh, did you take any formal training when it comes to your broadcasting? Did you take any schooling for it? Or was this something you, you got into, happened to get into it, and learned <clears> along <throat> the way, just got experience through working with other people in the industry? Yeah, pretty much that. Um, I, I got a degree in, in communications. I did PR. Um, when you work at minor league hockey, minor league sports, you're, you know, if you're the play-by-play guy, you're also the PR guy. You're running the website. You're probably selling tickets. You're doing a million different things. Um, I really focused on the on the PR communications website stuff, and the play-by-play was, you know, kind of more the fun stuff. 
that was what I looked forward to doing as opposed to the, you know, the day-to-day office grind of, you know, just running the business. Um, so as far as like, t- you know, I, I've, I've picked, I, I've had the opportunity to pick the brains of a lot of people that, that I respect. Um, but a lot of it's just trial and error. That's, uh, you know, there's a certain, um, there's a certain sect of, uh, I think, broadcasters that, uh, you know, they all go to Syracuse and they all kind of sound the same. They kind of sound like Sean McDonough, who's excellent, but there's a certain style when you, you can hear, if we, oh, yeah, he went to Syracuse. Of course he did. He sounds like a Syracuse guy. Um, there, are other, there are other people like myself that kind of do, and we've kind of learned, like I said, trial and error, kind of by osmosis, just listening and working on it and um, calling a game or calling a match in a way that I, that I want to hear it. Um, and that's something else. You got to get used to hearing your your own voice. But when I call a match, I I envision myself listening. Well, how would I want to hear this called? How would I want to hear the announcer get excited? So I, I try to I try to go about it with that mindset. That's awesome. Uh, Bob is going to turn it over to you. Any last questions? Uh, we don't want to keep our guests too late here. Sure, sure. I, I did have one thing that I was wondering about. Uh, I read that about your work in Texas with Booker T and uh, Texas NWA. And you've worked a couple other companies that look like they uh, concentrate on uh, classic style wrestling, uh, 80s or 70s style wrestling. Um, How do you reconcile it when you have to call a match or some spots for a current company and you're not too crazy about the spots in the way that they fit into wrestling. I'm trying to word this judiciously <laughs> here. I, those weren't the words I was thinking of when I came up with this question, but um, we haven't had to do this too much in our company. In fact, very rarely at all, but I've always wondered how you would deal with a spot that you just personally don't like, uh, but you don't want to show the company that you don't like it either. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's important. You get you know you're you're getting paid to to do a job and to and to and to put over what the product is. Um, so there, uh, there's a couple, I guess, facets to that answer for me. Number number one, I'm kind of selective about the stuff I do. Um, I try to stay away from, you know, if we're gonna use a cornet as a mud show shit, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a company in, in, in Florida that, that I do. I live in Gainesville. There's a company here called Fest Wrestling, which is just wild, crazy party wrestling. A friend of mine runs it. I live here. There's a music festival that's that's involved with it. Um, I'm not 100% on board with some of the style of, of, of the matches, but that's the one kind of guilty, you know, crazy, nonsensical wrestling show that, you know, that, that I allow myself to do and just kind of have fun with it. Um so I, I think that's that's key in some ways. Just have have. I mean, we're not curing cancer here. We're calling wrestling, right? So, yeah. Um, but that said, there are times when I've called a match and I got to put something over, or if something's just you know really dumb. I'll let my color guy take care of it. Um, or you just kind of you know the, another way to approach that is you know you try to make set the play by play guy the the straight man so to speak as opposed to the color guy, the straight man's job is to kind of make sense of the nonsensical, right? And sometimes that's as easy as just being completely flummoxed by what the hell's going on. Oh, my God, this is crazy, right? Now, that said, after the match, you know, once we hit stop, do I turn to my color guy and bury what the fuck just happened? That happens from time to time. <laughs> um, there, there, there have been a couple of ma- Hey, what would you think of the match? I'm like, yeah, it was great. No, yeah. no, no. We want to know, you know, what what, what did you think? And I, like I've gone into discussions about, okay, well, you did this, which completely didn't make sense in, in the context of the, like, why would you do that? Different styles, different, you know. Um, so that's kind of the way that's kind of the way I handle it. Um, I try to put over I try to be as positive as I can with with stuff. Luckily, there hasn't I haven't called too much that I look at. And I'm like, that was just dumb. That was just stupid. I haven't had a ton of that, um, but certainly, you know, with, if somebody blows the spot in a match, you know, you, you, you try to cover it. You try to you try to make sense of it. Um, an example of that would be everybody's using doors now, right? Because you can't buy can't buy wooden tables, so everybody's going through doors, right? Why would there be a door under the ring? So the easy so Cornette actually kind of led me here. When when it looks like a door, it's a door. How do you get around? But if it's wood, if it's just regular wood. Oh, it's a ring board. It's an extra ring board. 
Just yeah. right. So, so there, there, there are ways that you can keep up this or try to keep up the suspension of, 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 of disbelief. But there are times where it's just, you know, uh, it, 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 it depends on on the promoter. There's some promotions that that are just like, yeah, it's all fake. Who cares? It's all dumb. We're just gonna do whatever we want. Yeah. You know, that's not my style. That's not the wrestling that I like. If you're if you're winking, nodding at everybody. What's the point of being invested in it? That's my take on it. But you know, some people like that car crash stuff, and for the you know for the people that like that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing those people like. <laughs> <laughs> Never gonna fix that anyway. So, but no, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time here to talk to us. Uh, this is a wealth of knowledge. Learned so much here today. Uh, before uh, we end the show here, though, just want to give you an opportunity to let people know what you got going on, what you got coming up, and uh, plug your social media as well too. Yeah, I'm on Twitter uh, at Rich Bocchini, R I C H B O C C H I N I. I'm also on Instagram, uh, just uh, at Rich Bocchini. I think is is the name. I don't post a ton of wrestling stuff on there. I'm more wrestling uh, centric on on Twitter. But fe- you know, a lot of travel stuff. Pictures from airplane windows is what I like to what I like to put up on Instagram. Um, we've got uh, this weekend, uh, the 17th of December. I'm going to be in Seattle for Defy. Um, that's uh, I don't know if you had a chance to, to see Defy, but they, they take more of a classic style uh, mixed with modern. The, the, the look of the building is incredible in Washington Hall. The, the, the crowd's super, super loud. It's probably one of my favorite promotions to do. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll be there for that. Uh, Defy on demand. We, we'll have to show up a couple days after that. I'm also going to be doing uh, uh, Deadlock Pro Wrestling. They're out of the Carolinas. I've got a show coming up for them. Uh, Warrior Wrestling in Chicago. I think I'm going to be in South Bend in January. And what else do I have coming up? Those are the those are the three that I can think of right now. It all kind of sometimes blends together. Oh, perfect. Well, hopefully everybody checks out uh, checks out your work. Uh, checks out this as well too. If you're watching on any of our channels, make sure to like, subscribe. Also, uh, go follow Rich Bokiti. Check out everything that he's got going on. And we just want to say a big mess thank you for taking the time out of your day. Join the two of us and just chit chat about the kind of wrestling we like and be able to pick your brain about commentary as well it's been an absolute pleasure rich thank you very much we appreciate it guys i really appreciate you having me and uh, you know let's let's do it again we don't have a whole ton of time here uh tonight but you know we could probably talk about stuff for hours so you know feel free let's you know let's get together again and sure. uh, let's do it again fantastic That'd be great really appreciate it thank you very much thanks, thanks again rich sure